Hello everyone, my name is Phoenix. I'm the legal advisor for Exceed the Bar. We are a company who specialize in legal advisory or providing legal advisory and business psychology services. Uh, one of the services that we offer is to tutor law students and uh, to guide them through the various LLB modules. Um, we groom people for careers in law uh, and we also offer legal recruitment, uh, law recruitment to place candidate legal practitioners, uh, that is, uh, you know, pupils, candidate attorneys, um, in suitable positions. Our content is supplementary and complementary to all university uh, LLB degree modules. The preamble to the Constitution of South Africa lays out uh, several of our country's visions, but amongst these uh, visions is the imperative to free the potential of each and every person in this country. Uh, we recognize the potential of every person and we want every law student in particular to do well in their careers. Uh, to this end, we will seek to sharpen your legal prowess, your knowledge, your skills, and to guide you through your studies to a full uh, in-depth understanding of law. We will also help iron out any problematic subject areas that you may encounter. Uh, our offering includes practical visual skills and things that you may not be taught at law school or university. Our materials are loaded with tips and efficient ways of processing things in law. As part of our post-study services, we endeavor to offer law firms and their principals with best matched uh, students readily chiseled for their articles or pupillage and to place students on a solid footing to a career in law. You can browse our website at www.exceedthebar.com. Uh, our contact details are included at the end of this particular workshop. Thank you for joining us. How to master the textbook? Well, we've just mastered the study guide. And so pretty much a lot of what you've already learned will be applied to the textbook. It's just with the textbook because it's a large volume of knowledge. Uh, there's a few extra things that we need to do to get you to study it. Uh, there's a few examples of the textbooks already in the, your uh, LLB program, some of the common books. Yours might be different prescribed books, but these are generally what's available in uh, your uh, degree uh, curricula. So we know that you need to be guided by the study guide. That's what it's there for, it's a guide. But if you have time to work through the whole textbook, Bonsela, go for it, all right? But it is just too much to read. Uh, there's no time to read it all. Uh, and so you need to get through it all in time to revise for the exams. But you need to be able to extrapolate what is pertinent and relevant. A lot of textbooks, and I mean, this is not an attack on the authors of the textbooks. I mean, they are great uh, uh, academic minds and uh, advocates and attorneys who have put these books together, even judges. But a lot of it is waffle for uh, academic purposes of the LLB program. Okay, and I say that with tongue in cheek, <laughs> because really you can never know everything, uh, but you should just try to consolidate your understanding from whatever you read. Uh, the textbooks go in depth into several cases with a hell of a lot of cases um, to back up the points that they make. So what you need to do is you need to read for relevance. You need to read to confirm what you already know and you read, need to read more than the recommended. And coming back to read to confirm, it's not just to confirm what you already know, because that would be just be self-reinforcing. Maybe if you know something that's not uh, correct and you read to find what's <laughs> anything to confirm that incorrectness, then it's obviously not right. So here to clarify, read to confirm, it also means, you know, read to clarify. Um, 
So the same principles that you encountered in reading the study guide, it applies to reading the textbook. There's a first reading, a second, third reading, only we're going to do it a little bit differently in textbooks. In textbooks, we're going to have seven readings. We'll come to that in a moment. And trust me, it doesn't not take as long as what it takes for possibly the study guide. But you are going to be incorporating your highlighting tips from the previous video. You are going to be using the same margin note tips. So those uh, abbreviations that you put for different categories of law that you can spot it easily when you go back for revision um, and, or application are there free, freely within the textbook reading that you're doing. Um, you can get away with spot reading for assignments, but certainly not for exams. Exams, you need to have a good, holistic, integrated understanding of your uh, study material. Um, so your textbook needs to cross-reference to the study guide. And as we said in the study guide reading, um, the chapters of your study guide are, in general, uh, aligned to the chapters uh, in your textbook. Uh, so you need to understand how all the legal categories relate to that particular subject. Um, in terms of updating academic insights, you will see some of these textbooks, they often get uh, edited and revised. So they come out as revised editions with additional information within them. Um, and that is because much of the laws have changed and uh, possibly many of the precedents have already been overruled and overwritten um, and new precedents have been set in our various courts. Um, so from time to time they do uh, issue new textbooks. Um, uh, it's your onus to stay abreast of current cases and news. Um, your textbooks, the basic principles are there. They are never going to change. Uh, but some of the cases may change, especially the more recent cases that uh, they use to substantiate their reasoning within the textbooks. Um, your varsity, your college, your law school will in any case update the subjects readily, especially in fast flow slab su subjects, subjects, a little lap. Okay, but um, things like, you know, constitutional law, company law, labor law, tax law especially, there's always new laws, new regulations, uh, new cases. It's a fast flow uh, uh, f a field of law. In your more uh, older fields of law, like insolvency law, business law to a certain extent, uh, statutory interpretation, um, things don't change as quickly as these subjects that I've already mentioned. Uh, one last word is if you're planning to sell your textbooks, then obviously don't highlight or write in them. Make sense? Because you're going to be destroying them and you're going to be reducing the value that they're worth. I, in any case, advise you to keep your textbooks. Keep them for life. You know, these form part of your legal library, your law library. They, they are your reference books when you practice law, uh, even after completing your qualification, and even after some of them have become outdated. As I said, the principles uh, are basic, and the principles uh, lay within your uh, textbooks. And these you need when you apply to various legal scenarios going forward in your legal career. Uh, many judgments from the Constitutional Court also refer to textbooks when deliberating points of law, um, which is very fascinating that, you know, you can be reading your criminal law and you'll find uh, one of the uh, Concord judges is already referring to something that Sneiman wrote, and you will find it in the footnotes of several judgments, uh, not just uh, criminal law, but uh, many different aspects of, you know, law. So as I said just now, we are going to give your textbook seven readings. Uh, think about it this way. Every time you read it, seven readings, you should, should know it after that, right? <laughs> but um, it's a, it sounds like a lot of work, but it's how we do law. Law is 90% of admin, organization and preparation. So if you master it, you will be on top of your game. Coming to the first reading. And here's where it gets easy. 
Uh, you can even do this within your um, uh, study guide. In fact, I would advise you to, but more especially for, for, for voluminous works like textbooks. So the headings and subheadings form your first reading. Read through the table of contents. If the book does not show subheadings, then just page through it and read through the headings. Get, get an idea of the structure of the book. You will learn a lot from just doing that. Then move on to the introduction and conclusion to each chapter. You will see in these Oxford uh, textbooks, they are pretty much structured that way. The Deutus textbooks have a little bit of a different structure as do LexisNexis textbooks. Um, but generally there is a beginning and an end to each chapter uh, and uh, they give you the gist of what the chapter is about. So once you've done your headings and sub readings just go through the introduction and conclusion to each chapter. So just imagine you've got a thick 300 page textbook, you've got um, uh, several chapters in, once you've gone through the headings and subheadings that will literally take you five to ten minutes seriously. Then you go and you read the introduction and conclusion of each that will take you another 10, 20 minutes maybe, depending how fast you read. And then what you do is you go back to your tutorial letter and it will tell you, usually, either there or the study guide, it will tell you, you know, whether um, some points or, or parts of the textbook are uh, examinable. So it will tell you pretty much what you can leave for purposes of study, um, which is great. Uh, that helps you get through things very fast. Um, uh, and, and you can literally take a pencil and just, you know, exit those parts out within your textbook. Then you know while you're reading it, oh, I don't have to touch this part. Um, spot read for the assignments then. So what I'm saying now is once you've got that gotten this far, so your fourth reading is going to spot read for the assignments. You Again, consult your study guide, your tutorial letters, your online um, assignments portal uh, and have a look at the kind of questions that they want you to answer to qualify for the exams and um, spot read for the assignments. You go back and you say, okay, this will apply to this question's answer, this will apply to that question's answer and you read those first. Make a few notes if you like on the side. Then you come back and here is like, this is akin to your second or third reading in the study guide. In the textbook, your fifth reading will be to read, categorize and highlight. So apply the abbreviations, color coding techniques that you did to the study guide, just do the same in your textbook. Then you do your sixth reading where you make supplementary notes and this is covered under the chapter three below, I suppose, the next video. Uh, these are vital to your grasp of law and to consolidate everything that you read into one doc. So supplementary notes, we do have a uh, dedicated video on that within this course, how to uh, study law, um, where we actually show you how to make certain kinds of notes, sensible things. And these notes, I mean, these are what you're going to study for your exam, not your textbook necessarily. Uh, your textbook you will spot read and you will just look for all the categories and make sure that you understand it from a holistic point of view. But in your notes, this is where you are going to reduce the content of your textbook and, and uh, study guide into several pages that you will be able to learn for the exam. That makes it easier. It's kind of like just uh, breaking things down, making it smaller and easier to study. Uh, and then your seventh reading is to spot read for the exam revision, but rely on your notes. So here you're going to integrate your notes with the textbook. Um, you qualify for exams by doing the assignments. So do the assignments without delay. Obviously you can't do an assignment until you know some part of the uh, knowledge given your, your study guides, textbooks, case law, legislation, etc. But um, you do need to get onto the assignments as soon as you get onto your third reading here. Uh, always try to simplify matters that you read. One day you're going to have your client that's going to brief you about his own legal problem and you're going to have to be able to consolidate um, your understanding and application of law uh, towards your client. You're going to be able to going to have to be able to explain to your client in layman's terms, hey guy, this is how this works, etc. Um, 
Uh, so no rote learning is allowed. You need to be able to explain it briefly in simple language um, as if you are talking to a client. It's all very well knowing all the Latin terms and fancy uh, legal jargon um, and all the complicated jurisprudence uh, down the line, but that's not going to serve any purpose because down the line you need to make money and if your client is going to sit there confused as hell because you're coming out with all these weird and wonderful things, he's just going to say, I need to find another legal uh, practitioner. So the trick is to keep it simple and to understand it from that perspective. If you battle to explain something, you're not going to be able to answer that question at all, whether in an assignment or in the exam. So get it in simple terms. It's not actually that difficult. All right, turning to mastering legislation. Uh, Here I'm giving an example of how to study legislation. So we're taking the Cyber Crimes Act of 19 uh, of 2020. There you can see it. There's the nice gazetted version of it. Those are like the first two pages of um, uh, the Cyber Crimes Act. So there are two rules that one starts off with. The first is you must know how to read statutes from your law skill course. Um, that's a basic first year course. There's a way to uh, reading statutes and identifying things in statutes. We're briefly going to go through it here with you just to give you a, a visual understanding of uh, what we're looking for. Uh, and secondly, legislation cannot be learned. It is what it is. You must accept that you must interpret it. Um, and if you understand those things, you're going to understand legislation a lot easier. So first thing is we want to source this act. So there's the, the Cyber Crimes Act, Act 19 of 2020, GN Government Notice 324 in Government Gazette 44651 of 672 of the 1st of June 2021. Holy cow. Where does all that information come from? Okay, so your act comes from here. You can see it there. The Government Gazette says the Presidency have titled it the Act Number 19 of 2020 Cyber Crimes Act 2020. And there, you, all you do is you just regurgitate it. Then we've got where does the government notice comes from? You can see there's a number uh, or government number if you like three to four. That's where we get that number from. Uh, and then the volume number is always in brackets, and the Gazette number is that long funny number there, GG. And it is from the published on the 1st of June 2021. Does that make this act valid from that point in time? Yes, no. Yes, it's valid because it's been published. Is it with, it, with effect? Is it in effect? Maybe, maybe not. For that, we need to do a little bit more digging. So the first thing we want to see is when the act was assented to. And here, the 26th of May 2021 um, is when this uh, gazette was gazetted to. Where do we get that? It says on top of the Act, um, assented to on the 26th of May 2021 by the President. So we know, okay, it's been signed into force. Um, the second thing you want to see is when the Act actually comes into force. And to find that out, we check the very last clause of the Act so we can page almost to the end just before we get to the schedules, the tables at the end of the Act. And you'll see that there's usually a clause that is entitled short title and commencement. And this act in, uh, for uh, cyber crimes is, um, it comes into effect on a date yet to be proclaimed by the state president, as well as certain other parts of the act will come into effect on different dates. So to answer the question, is this act uh, in force yet? No, it's not. Well, at that point it wasn't. It is, of course, now. I mean, now we're already, what, at the time I'm making this lecture is already 2023, January. So it's definitely in, in force, but there is a proclamation that came into effect. Um, when this act was assented to, it was basically on hold pending presidential proclamation when parts of it must take effect. So in other words, when an act is, you know, gazetted, it's made publicly known, in other words, um, it's like being given a Ferrari with no fuel or like being given an AK-47 without bullets. 
there's nothing you can do with that act until it comes into force. And even when it's in force, certain parts of that act may not be retrospectively applied or retroactively applied. In other words, they, they may, might not be backdated. They may only take effect from that particular date that it comes into force. So these are the things that you need to understand, especially when it comes to applying law, both in your assignments and your exam, and to you know clients and, and uh, people that you consult with. So on the other side of the page there, under the broad uh, letters, uh, bold uh, font, capitalized letters, we've got this is the long title, and that's usually the bold uh, part preceding the actual blah, blah, blah of the act. This is the long title. The short title, how to refer to this act, is spelled out in the last clause. The long title spells out the purpose and the intention behind the act. We always need to understand what the legislature intended when passing the act. And really, guys, this is a, a, a most fundamental part of law. When you're talking about law, uh, when you're studying law, you need to understand what was the legislature's um, intention in passing that legislation, right? Um, because that will spell out the applicability of the act and the relevance of the act to a particular scenario. Um, and the crux of most legal arguments in court usually boil down to interpreting this intention. You will learn about this in the uh, course uh, statutory interpretation or interpretation of statutes, whichever your uh, varsity uh, calls it. Um, so chapter one in your um, legislation or your table of contents, not all uh, legislation have a table of contents, especially older legislation, but your more, more newer legislation usually has that. That's the structure of it. But chapter one is generally deals with the definitions, key definitions of key terms that are used within that particular legislation. So I would say read all the chapter and section and subsection headings for the overview of the act. And this will tell you how it's structured so you know what to read for relevance. So if the question involves, you know, a functionary who is guilty of misconduct, he hasn't conducted himself in an apt way, you would want to go and have a look at somewhere in that act where it talks about the roles and functions, duties and responsibilities, obligations of that particular functionary. Um, if it's a civil procedure or a criminal procedure point, you will want to go and have a look at the relevant clauses there. Has the correct procedure been uh, applied and adopted in, in the particular matter? Um, has it been processed accordingly, lawfully? Um, if you are dealing with, you know, sanctions, penalties, fines, all that sort of stuff, punishment, there are relevant clauses for that. So you will just go through the act and see what is relevant for you. Um, what we then also need to understand is the repeals, amendments and regulations of the particular act. So acts are statutes, they are legislation, it's codified laws. These are all synonyms for the word act or legislation. Don't get confused. Um, so several pieces of legislation may uh, tie into any given legal problem in the question. All right, so we need to have a look where it talks about the general provisions in, in the uh, particular legislation, and it will usually entitle somewhere about what laws are repealed or amended, uh, etc. So always look for those that clause. It determines what other laws have been affected, and you will always find these at the end of the Act. When several laws are affected, it's common to find the accompanying schedule to this clause and Act. So you start off with applying the principle, the Constitution is supreme. What do we mean by that? Well, it's quite simple. Um, every Act or legislation is subservient to the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa 1996 and um, anything inconsistent with the Constitution may be declared invalid by a court of law. Um, some acts have alternative languages so in here we've got English on the right hand side, Afrikaans on the left hand side, some acts have Zulu, some acts have Sutu, some acts have, you understand. 
Any law offending the Constitution can be declared inconsistent, invalid, and un unconstitutional, as I've just said. A limitation can be imposed on you know, that particular uh, clause uh, if it's reasonable and justifiable in an open democratic society based on dignity, equality, and freedom. That comes straight from our Constitution. That is the basic, fundamental to studying law is study it through the lens of the constitution it's our holy grail um, there's also a regulations clause um, and it usually uh, appears when a minister has to delegate uh, administrative responsibilities to for example the director general of the department or and or some other functionary as applicable uh, and what follows from that is subordinate legislation to the Act. So regulations are frequently amended by the minister who's in charge. Um, so in other words, your regulations also need to be studied, not just the Act. But coming here to the, the end uh, or the schedule uh, to an Act, here to the Cyber Crimes Act, we've got uh, a schedule dealing with the laws that were repealed or amended and there you will see um, the number of the act, the short title of the act and exactly what was amended um, usually appearing in underlined text. Uh, not every act contains this. Uh, some acts contain other schedules involving you know functions, processes, forms, costs, jurisdictions etc etc. When you come to your things like your Magistrates Act, your Supreme Courts Act, um, uh, your board rules, um, you have schedules in the form of forms. They give you prescribed forms and formats in which uh, certain things need to be submitted to the courts. Um, one may find a transitional clause arrangement in the Act when a switch is made from a new system, process, body or law. That just means that uh, the Act, old Act has to be phased out whilst the new Act is being phased in. And it's important to understand because it will uh, highlight what needs to be handled uh, and what measures are in place during that transitional period. You need to take note of the following. Any appointment of functions or powers to a functionary, any creation of administrative structures, what the roles and functions of the said functionary body are, what is the act that is regulated, what procedures must be followed, what requirements or definitional elements arise, especially in things like criminal law, um, uh, who has jurisdiction, and what offences and sanctions are created and imposed by the Act. So the schedule contains which Act has been amended by the Act you are busy studying as well as the provisions that have changed. The repeal means that the provision has been permanently withdrawn from the date that it took effect and an amendment means the wording has been changed either by being added or subtracted. Um, so here in the cyber crimes example if you get going to your Cyber Crimes Act that we gave you. There are several acts that um, were either amended, repealed or scheduled and there you've got a list of them. It ranges from the Criminal Procedure Act, the SAPS Act, the Films and Publications Act, right down to Eureka Criminal Law uh, and Child Justice Act. So these things tell you a lot of things about the particular legislation that you're studying and how it applies to legal problems that you're dealing with. One day when you specialize, you will become a fundi on select statutes in those fields. Then you will probably be know pretty much a lot of the law or almost by rote. Um, but then you will never, up until then, you'll never know it all. There's just too much to learn. So uh, unless you have the capabilities of Mark Ross with his photographic memory, my advice is just get acquainted with the general purpose and intent of the prescribed act. Use these for reference and read only in depth when seeking answers to legal problems. Thank you for watching this video. Please do share this video far and wide. Um, you can also contact us. We're eager to help you in your uh, studies um, and to master your uh, LLB and get on top of your career. Uh, we have there a list of all the uh, subjects that we are providing uh, where we guide you through the module. Um, a lot of your uh, 
study sessions, groups, module, uh, modulators, etc., don't offer what we are offering here. We're giving you a visual um, step-by-step uh, guide through your studies. And of course, feel free to subscribe to our free booster courses there. These are vital not just for the study of law or for your law degree, but also for your career in general. Um, thank you very much.